For this episode of TAC TikTok, Jacqueline and I caught up with Dr. Elise Hewitt, the founding program director for Logan University's Master of Science in Integrative Pediatrics. She's a board certified pediatric doctor of chiropractic and one of the foremost authorities in the special of chiropractic pediatrics. Listen on to hear what she had to say. Here I am with Dr. Elise Hewitt on TAC TikTok, right? My name is Joe Bush. I'm the editor of the American Chiropractor Magazine. I'm here with my sister, Jacqueline Toussard, who's the publisher. And so what we like to do here, Dr. Hewitt, is delve deeper into the articles that we have in the magazine. So recently we carried an article which featured you about your role with the Masters of Science program that you've been developing at Logan University for child pediatrics and chiropractic. I think it's called an integrative pediatrics master's program. So welcome to the show. Could you just tell us a bit about yourself and your background? How did all this materialize? Oh my gosh, that's a big question. Well, first, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Uh, It's very nice to meet both of you. And I'm excited to share some information about the program and most importantly, to talk about chiropractic pediatrics, because that's been a passion of mine for my whole career. And my whole goal in life is just to have more children have access to high quality chiropractic care so they can live, you know, the life that they're meant to live. So let's see, how did I get here? (laughs) I was actually pre-med when I went to college and my goal was to cure cancer. You know how idealistic you can be when you're young. (laughs) Go big, right? Go big or go home. (laughs) That's right. Exactly. How are you Um, doing with that? (laughs) Yeah, well, I took a little bit of a left turn and then a right turn. And my, actually, mm-hmm. my best friend died of cancer when we were 16. And oh, um, wow. so that's when I decided I didn't want anyone else to suffer with this. And I was going to, you know, figure it out. And mm-hmm. I went to chiropractic, or I mean, I went to college, it was pre med, worked in a medical lab for a while and got pretty disillusioned with the whole thing. I realized cancer is more about prevention than about waiting till it's there and and trying to fix it at that point. And that really wasn't the focus for medicine. And I grew up on the East Coast, never heard about chiropractic as a kid. I learned later that there was this underground field, but I never heard about it. And so I left that school. I changed majors. I moved to Colorado, had a great time skiing out West, ended up with a Bachelor of Environmental Design, worked in that field for a year. But but then I wanted to really get back into medicine or healthcare. It really was my calling. And at that point, I had learned about chiropractic care, had been helped by a chiropractor, but more importantly, chiropractic really aligned with my own philosophy of health a lot better and aligned with my goals of prevention and wellness rather than waiting for something to appear and, and also getting to the root cause of a problem and fixing it at that level. And so I ended up going to Western States in Portland, Oregon, the University mm-hmm. of Western States is called now, and got a great education there. And when I graduated, I treated anyone, you know, I started my own practice and you'll treat anyone who is daring enough to come into your front door. But I quickly learned that I really had a passion for treating kids. So, you know, if an adult would call me on the weekend, our policy was we'd always treat and no matter what it was we or when it was, we would go and meet someone at the office on the weekend if they needed us. And I'd go in and, and meet an adult and treat them. But when a, when a mom called and said, my son just fell down the stairs, can you help us? I'd be excited about it and really look forward to it. And so I realized that's when I needed to, that's where I wanted to, needed to focus my energy. That's where my passion was. And so I really started to hone in on pediatrics at that point. I had taken some pediatrics post-grad seminars when I was in college and chiropractic college took a lot more, ended up doing some research in that area and became a founding member of the ICA's Pediatrics Council and the ACA's Pediatrics Council. I think maybe Mm -hmm. the only person on the planet who is a founding member of both of those. For me, it's not about politics at all. It's just about how do we help more kids? So absolutely. Yeah. That's kind of the long road of of how I got where I am. (laughs) Well, and that's a great story. And that's very common that we all start out with those giant, you know, we want to cure cancer, save the world. And then, yeah, we just fall back into chiropractic, like as it's better to avoid it in some cases, right? So if we can, or so very insightful story. Now, do you currently practice Dr. Hewitt? Yes. So I am in practice. My practice has been limited to pediatrics for probably close to 30 years now. I've been in practice for 
34 years or something like that. I can't do the math anymore. It's been too long. (laughs) But yeah, so I treat only children and most of my new patients come in on referrals from lactation consultants for babies who are having nursing problems, from pediatricians, from occupational therapists. It's a physical therapist. My practice is referral only. Um, And when I first got into practice and really wanted to specialize in pediatrics, I was told by one of the giants in our profession that it wasn't possible, that you couldn't survive having a practice with seeing only children. And there had it hadn't been done before. And so, but I just knew that that was wrong. I just knew there were so many kids who needed our help who didn't know about. And so that's, that's the direction I went. And now my practice, it's waiting list. In fact, it's, you know, everyone dreams of a waiting list practice, but it's actually kind of hard because, you know, I have a mom who calls with a baby who can't nurse. I can't tell them, well, I'll see you in two months. You know, that's my next new patient opening. So I love what I do. It's amazing. What were some of the limitations that you had coming out of school when you identified this as being your niche? I mean, chiropractic college and that the whole program, you you cover a tremendous amount of information, right? And so there are definitely areas that probably everyone is not prepared to attend children and definitely on the level that you're doing. So what are some of the limitations that you found and, and what were some of the solutions that you identified as you went through? Yeah, I think, you know, that everybody does a great job in the chiropractic edu- educational world, fitting in as much as they can into the limited time that they have with their students. And most doctors don't end up specializing in pediatrics. And so there isn't a lot of pediatric education included in their chiropractic, their overall chiropractic schooling. There is enough pediatrics to, um, for every chiropractor to be safe, you know, with a child to understand how to modify techniques, how to recognize when to refer. And we are licensed in all 50 states to treat children. So, you know, and and so we are, we are examined on that and make sure that we do know enough about pediatrics to be safe. But for Mm -hmm. those of us who want to go into pediatrics in more depth and see more children, I think most chiropractors would tell you that more education in that area is needed, just like with any specialty. If you want to specialize in neurology, you you don't get it. We get enough neurology to understand the basics, but not enough to be a, 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 chiropractic neurologist. And so the same thing with you want to be a pediatric chiropractor, you're going to need more training in that area. And so there are diplomate programs available, certification programs that have done a good job over the years. I have one of those. So I've been through that program. I understand it. The big problem with the diplomate programs is they don't have any external oversight. There's no accrediting body outside of chiropractic and outside of those who are involved with the individual programs to verify that, you know, what they say is taught is actually taught and then it's taught at the level that it's supposed to be and that sort of thing. So what we've done at Logan is we've created the first master of science program in pediatrics for chiropractors. And this program is accredited, fully accredited by HLC, which is the arm of the U.S. Department of Education that accredits schools in Missouri. So it's a fully accredited program. And the advantage of that you know, first of all, it keeps us to a very high standard. We have to keep education up there. But the advantage of it is also that it's recognized outside of the walls of chiropractic. So it's recognized across professions. They understand what a master accredited master of science is. And so mm-hmm. the degree holders with a master of science in integrative pediatrics are going to be recognized when they go into a hospital, potentially to work there, They're recognize that they have this Master of Science in Pediatrics. They could go into work in a multidisciplinary clinic. They could go on to teach at the university level. You know, there are a lot of opportunities with an accredited Master of Science that we don't get with any of the other internal certifications that we have in chiropractic. So that was uh, really the reason for developing this master's program. I think it's fascinating. I think it's fascinating. So how many now have you been approached by people outside of the profession that might want to take advantage of that? And, or is it only available to chiropractors? Right now, the program is you have to have a DC in order to enter mm-hmm. the program or the international equivalent of a doctor of chiropractic in order mm-hmm. to enter the program. There is a pathway for students with advanced standing to get into the program as well. Usually it's in their last year once they've been a treating clinician in a, a educational clinic of some kind on campus or off campus, then they're able to apply for the program as well. You know, if you want to talk about down the road, I can see us developing tracks for other license holders. So they could mm-hmm. also have this integrative pediatrics master of science. So for example, naturopaths, acupuncturists, nurse practitioners, you know, who, whatever other specialties want to mm-hmm. specialize in pediatrics, 
But right now we're starting with focusing on chiropractic and getting that, you know, really solid base under us. And then how long does that take? Is it a year long program? Is it something that they take while in school? You know, like you're saying as, as a master's, I'm thinking is, do they, are these practicing doctors or is it more when you're in a student level? Do you have to suspend your life to get into this master's program to do it? Yeah, such a good question because, you know, what chiropractor isn't crazy busy with their practice and their family and all of that. And so the, this program is actually designed to work around the busy chiropractor's life. So it's, it's offered online. So 90% of it is online. There is each year, once a year, all the students come together on the Logan campus to practice all of the hands-on techniques they've learned um, mm-hmm. in that term. And also so they can be assessed in person for the application of those techniques. So it's online and it's asynchronous, which means that it's given, you know, you can work around your own schedule that you don't have to sit in the chair at nine o'clock in front of your computer and, you know, attend the lecture. The lectures are uh, all of the coursework and all the materials are available online at any time. And Mm -hmm. so students can fit it in around their busy lives. Now, with that said, it's also very instructor driven, meaning there's a lot of an instructor interaction there. Um, there are assignments that are timed and graded and you get feedback on the assignments. Instructors participate in discussions on the discussion board and they're really, they have office hours every week. So they're very available for students, even though it is a distance, mostly a distance program. And to answer your question about students, right now, most of our students are doctors of chiropractic. We actually have students from four different countries. So Europe and Latin America and the United States. And it is open to students in that final year. So students can dual enroll for the first year of the program. And they'll, you know, they're usually their last year of chiropractic school. Great. So how many students have already enrolled? And I mean, I guess this was just rolled out recently, right? So yeah, we just have our very first cohort started in September. So it's Mm -hmm. been about six or seven weeks now. Um, mm-hmm. And we have 13 students enrolled. Mm-hmm. Our goal was 20. We actually started with 16. And for personal reasons, a few had to defer until the spring. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we're thrilled with, you know, it's interesting when you're starting a new program like this, because it's not just a new master's program. It's a new field of math of master's programs. So right. if a student is looking for, let's say a doctor wants to specialize in, in sports, they can Google, you know, and come up with a lot of different sports chiropractic programs that they could participate in and figure out which one is right for them. But nobody is looking for pediatric master's programs right now because nobody knows they exist. Mm -hmm. So the hard part for us isn't like the demand is there. There's a huge interest in chiropractic pediatrics, but it's getting the word out right now that there is the program and that there is this pathway for students to follow. Um, So we were thrilled that to get like 75% of the seats filled in the, in the first class. I think that really shows, you know, how much interest there is. Oh, I think there's a tremendous amount of interest. Mm -hmm. Yep. And and I think it, you know, outside of the United States, there's even Mm -hmm. more of a need than, than Mm -hmm. inside for this, because, you know, there are a lot of kids who live outside the United States who, who have a, you know, a a lot of healthcare needs that aren't being met and chiropractors can really meet that. This is really why we wanted to feature you, especially I wanted to even ask if I may to interrupt here too, was with all of the different kinds of developmental conditions we're seeing present, you know, with children these days, you know, whether ADD, it's from, ADHD, autism, you know, learning disabilities, you're mentioning. So I wanted to find out what kind of expectations, you know, if they're, you know, positive outcomes and things like that, that you've been seeing based on certain conditions. Are there things that you could start giving hope to say, well, this is something that if you catch it early enough, it can be better managed than other things? Have you had good experience with this so far? Oh, my gosh. I mean, I've been in in practice for 34 years now, and I've seen, you know, all kinds of different pediatric conditions. And what I've learned is that I can never say for sure if I'm going to be able to help someone or not. But I also never rule out the idea that my care may be, really be able to help a child. So, mm-hmm. you know, the body's very complex and, and what we do is amazingly powerful. And what, mm-hmm. you know, basically the way I look at it is we use, you know, we're holistic doctors. So, so, you know, I deal with the whole child, not just looking at their, their musculoskeletal system. So that, that's a big part of what I do, but I also deal with the nutrition side and, and lifestyle advice and, and all of that sort of stuff. But of course, focusing on the musculoskeletal part, I, I can address non-musculoskeletal issues through the musculoskeletal system. So Mm -hmm. I don't treat, you know, a a two-month-old doesn't come in to see me because they're complaining of back pain. 
but they right. have a poor latch. And mm-hmm. where is that latch coming? You know, what's happening with the latch? Well, it, it turns out that if I do a short course of spinal care and cranial work, their latch improves. In fact, sometimes it improves when I hand the baby back to the mom after the first treatment. Sometimes it takes a few visits. But the mm-hmm. studies are now showing that about 80% of babies who have a short course of chiropractic care, babies who have what's called suboptimal breastfeeding or nursing problems, about 80% of those babies will be able to exclusively breastfeed after just a couple of weeks of care. So it's incredibly impactful. And studies are now showing that when we all know that breastfeeding is so important to a baby, right, for their long-term health, short-term health, long-term health, mm-hmm. it turns out that breastfeeding is more impactful for the mother's health than it is for the baby's health. And this is something that we've only just discovered over the last five years or so. And what that means is in mothers who breastfeed, there's less breast cancer, less ovarian cancer, there's less um, myocardial infarction, less hypertension, less postpartum depression, of course, improved mother-infant bonding. And, mm-hmm. and these, all of these health impacts are not just during the period that they're breastfeeding, it's throughout the mother's lifetime. If a mother's able to breastfeed, she has these, these health improvements over her lifetime. And mm-hmm. so if you add up the cost savings, if you, if you add up the costs of, of suboptimal breastfeeding, in terms of um, the impacts on the baby and the impacts on the mother, it's it adds up in the United States to something like eighteen billion dollars a year. And right. so, if we can help eighty percent of those mother infant dyads breastfeed, we can have a tremendous impact on public health. Right. It's what you're saying. I mean, it makes so much sense, and it's tragic that it's only told in these environments. <laughs> this logic that you're dealing with and and how taking care of the mother is going to help take care of the mother down the line, right? When there's a debate on, there's a crisis because we don't have enough breast, what is it? Like infant powder or whatever. So yeah, the formula. Yeah. Clearly you must be covering maternity as well in the program. So is that being covered? Actually this this program is, so it's a master of science in integrative pediatrics. And so we talk about pregnancy as it relates to the fetus and the future, the future mm-hmm. health of the child. It's not uh, any, it's not a maternal program. And one of the things I've tried to do throughout my entire career is separate out pediatric care from women's health in our profession. Right. And, mm-hmm. and the reason is, you know, we started as a very small fish. We're still a pretty small fish in a very big <laughs> pond, but we were even smaller than we were before. And And so we had to kind of multitask. And so, you know, it became the pregnancy and infant, you know, pregnancy and and pediatric were all lumped together. And even when I was president of the ACA Pediatrics Council, which I was for 10 years, you know, it was was kind of lumped into one thing, even though it was the Pediatrics Council. And, Mm -hmm. you know, if you think about it, like you would never take your six-week-old baby to an obstetrician and you would never go as an eight-month pregnant woman to a pediatrician. Like there's, Mm -hmm. they're completely different animals. And so if you want to be a specialist in pediatrics, you can't also be a specialist in maternal and women's health. It's just, it's too much. And that's why medicine split it off years ago. And they had the Mm -hmm. resources to be able to do that. And I feel like now we are a a mature enough, a large enough profession Mm -hmm. to be able to do that same thing. And so a few years ago, we split off the maternal part. And in the ACA, there's now a council on women's health. And so there's the pediatrics council and the council on women's health. And so when we were building this pediatrics master's program, it was a very conscious thought to make it a pediatrics program. You wouldn't, you know, you don't ever find a an MD who's board certified in obst- in optometry in ob- sorry uh, in an OB DYN who's also taking some pediatric courses. It just doesn't make sense. It's right. two different specialties. So yeah, so this is just about pediatrics, mm-hmm. but we do talk about the pregnancy and embryology as it relates to the fetus and the child. Cool. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, because some of the diplomates and all that other stuff kind of just, <clears throat> but that's a different topic right. entirely. So. Who were some of the mentors of yours as you came through? Oh, such a good question. You know, it's funny because in pediatrics specifically, 
I didn't have a lot of mentors because I've, I've been breaking ground and I don't say that in an egotistical way. It's just, I just had to break ground to do what I, I wanted to do. And actually Dr. Muriel Perilot, I don't know if you're familiar with her. She's done some amazing things in pediatrics. She just retired recently, was named the ACA Pediatrics Council Chiropractor of the Year, Pediatric Chiropractor of the Year, I think either last year or the year before. She started the only on-campus pediatric clinic at a chiropractic institution in the United States. It happens to be at Logan. So she started that a few, maybe 10 years ago. So she's been a big inspiration. And I mean, there are many, many people in our profession who have inspired me in general in terms of what they've accomplished and how they've contributed. I mean, the list is too long to go through. Dr. Sportelli, he's just sure. big, been a big inspiration for me and, and has always provided me with a lot of encouragement. There's a pediatric doctor in New York, Dr. Karen Erickson, who does amazing things in her pediatric practice. I mean, some of these people are on my faculty, Dr. Dr. Claire Johnson. She's a huge inspiration. I mean, that, that, you know, what she does with mm-hmm. editor in chief for the flagship journals of our profession and, and all of the other ways she contributes. There, there are just, there are a lot of people that I, I thank in person and really appreciate their guidance and their inspiration. And I hope that I can do that someday for doctors coming behind me as well. I'm sure you have already. So what kind of techniques do you do? I mean, are you doing like diversified flying seven activator? I realize it's, you got a, a whole different approach. So, but is it, are these? Cranial. Yeah. You've mentioned some cranial techniques. Yep. So as far as a specific, there isn't like one specific technique, you know, as far as spinal mm-hmm. technique that works better for right. kids than others, all the techniques have to be modified tremendously in terms of obviously the amount of force we use, but the speed that with which you provide that mm-hmm. adjustment, the depth of the, you know, the maneuver right. itself. So there's a lot of adaptations that have to happen no matter what technique you use. Personally, mm-hmm. I do a lot of diversified adjusting. I don't use a lot of instruments. I feel like the hand, my hands are my best tool for sensing. And, and I really like to adjust children with my hands. Mm-hmm. And if you do it properly, adapting your technique, it's very safe. For- and with that said, I also think that cranial techniques are really important for especially treating young babies. Personally, I like to use craniosacral therapy. It's a very mm-hmm. gentle, soft technique that's very impactful. But until kids are really weight bearing and, you know, in a gravitational world, their issues tend to be more cranial than spinal. I mean, there's exceptions to everything. If they're pulled and twisted out a lot, that can impact their spine, of course. But a lot of times their initial issues have to do with cranial joint restrictions more so than spinal joint restrictions. So I, and I always, I personally, I do both on every patient that comes into my office. Mm-hmm. I check their entire spine, their mm-hmm. entire cranium. And of course, any extremities that need to be worked on, you know, is indicated by the exam and the history and the exam. But How exciting. No, that's definitely, you know, I didn't expect necessarily the cranial work that you mentioned. Of course, that's not taught in most yeah, core curriculum. That makes a lot so. of sense to me because yeah. the birthing process itself, I think, you know, I, that's going to have a huge trauma. to the. the oh, it, it, it makes sense. I'm just saying it's not taught in most <laughs> core curriculum. That's what, so it does require another... Yeah you know, depth of instruction, especially for kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, yeah, as those bones are fusing, right, in the first decade. So very interesting. Jacqueline, did we cover everything? Is there any other question you had for Dr. Hewitt? Actually, Dr. Hewitt, if you wanted, you know, we always want to make sure that before you leave here, if there is a main message that you'd like to communicate about pediatrics, um, about anything, you know, really, you're, you know, to encourage doctors, you know, is there any great advice one way or another? Oh boy, how long do you have? (laughs) I would say, I mean, just sort of general advice. I would say, follow your passion. If there's something that really interests you, if you know, if it's something that's never been done before in chiropractic, it doesn't matter. If it's something that interests you and you feel there's a need for it, go for it. Listen to those other voices that are saying maybe it's not possible, but just factor them in and, and keep going forward because. In my experience, if you follow your passion, you kind of live your dream. And I absolutely love what I do every day. When I go into the office, I'm excited to see my patients. It's, I still get amazed. I just last week, I had a six day old baby in the office who couldn't nurse and put my hands on this baby and really gently and got some releases and handed the baby back to mom. And the baby was able to nurse and mom was crying and brings tears to my eyes. Like it's just, it's very moving and powerful to do this kind of work. So if you're interested in pediatrics, 
definitely follow your heart on that one and go to Logan's website, logan.edu, look up the pediatrics master's program, know that that's there for you in the future. And I think, you know, if you're, if you're a doctor of chiropractic and you don't feel comfortable treating children, especially younger children, Mm -hmm. that's fine. You know, just find someone in your community who does treat children and just start sending the children that way. Mm -hmm. Very good, Dr. Hewitt. Very good. Dr. Joe, I can ask, I always like to add on a few extra ones at the end, at least, uh, Dr. Hewitt, in case. In case it, can get, it can get out of control, Dr. Hewitt. <laughs> because I'm a mother as well. I'm a mother as well. And so I've got to get in the yeah. questions if I've got an expert on kids, because I wanted to ask, two, you know, always some extra subjects. One, about special needs kids. Are there any kinds mm-hmm. of special needs kids you've seen that you've been amazed with or that you would say they definitely should or they shouldn't have chiropractic care? Oh, boy. Oh, so special needs kids, I mean, they're special for one thing. They're, it's amazing to work with kids who have special needs. Mm-hmm. But special needs kids are also just kids. And so mm-hmm. they can have some of the same problems that typical children have. And I always try to look at every child who comes into my office and and see the person that they are inside, not the physical body that they are outside, because inside we are all the same and we're all special (laughs) inside. Mm -hmm. And, And on the outside, some bodies don't work the same way and some bodies need more help than others. So Yes, I find kids who have seizures a lot of times, the seizures will tighten them up. So some regular chiropractic care can help loosen those joints back up again and help them be healthier between those seizures. I've treated lots of kids with autism and on various stages of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And they're all, everybody's different, you know, but I've seen all sorts of changes in kids, some who start to make better eye contact, some who stop, many who stop stimming or banging their head or whatever their particular stim is. I feel like a lot of times that's coming from discomfort. Did you know, so the dura mater that underlies all the cranial bones is some of the most pain sensitive tissue in the body. And if the mm-hmm. cranial bones are not moving properly, a contraction that dura mater causing a headache. And so a lot of times kids with autism, they bang their heads a lot. And, you know, we have to stop and ask, why are they doing that? A lot of times after some cranial work, they stop doing that. And I think it's because they're feeling better. They're, you know, they're not, not having that same discomfort that they used to have. So yeah, I think the most important thing is to treat every child as unique. And no matter what their abilities are, um, mm-hmm. we they do better in life if the joints in their spine and their cranium are moving properly. Wow. Well, and I wanted to ask on one more because Dr. Joe always loves this, but after coming out of the craziness of the past few years, and if I have the experience, the opportunity to connect with the and vaccine so, question. Yeah, I, I knew it was coming. Always, the COVID <laughs> question, because it's been such a marketing miracle and, you know, so successful, I guess, from the pharmaceutical standpoint. Dr. Joe, stop tapping your pencil. I can hear Sorry, you. Yeah. <laughs> but I was going to say, I wanted to find out whether COVID, whether the vaccines with the kids, are you seeing anything different? I don't know if you've seen kids who've been either from vaccinated parents and, you know, or just, I don't know if, it, you know, you're dealing with young pediatric. I don't know if you've seen kids have been vaccinated. Do you have a concern one way or another or COVID itself? What is your standpoint or your perspectives from what you've seen in your practice? From what I've seen in my practice, I haven't seen any ill effects one way or the other from the vaccine itself. In in general, I understand our profession is concerned with vaccinations mm-hmm. to a certain degree. However, I personally feel like it's out of our scope of practice. And so I don't discuss vaccines with my patients. If they have a question for me, I will send them back to their pediatrician. I'll send them to some resources that I think are science-based for them to be able to make some of their own decisions. Mm -hmm. But it's really out of my scope to discuss vaccines with them. I -hmm. have had two patients so far, pediatric patients with long COVID, serious Mm -hmm. one one middle school in particular now has to walk with a cane. She's in you know, has chronic headaches, is on medications for several different issues, all related to her long COVID. So long COVID is a real thing. It's it's pretty debilitating. So, you know, I don't I don't like I said, I don't recommend or or not recommend vaccines one way or the other. Personally, I don't think there's we had enough study to even know, you know, because everyone's concerned about long-term impacts, not short-term impacts. And we haven't had that long yet to really evaluate long-term impacts. So I think, you know, everyone has to do what, what they, what feels right to them. I'm, I'm a strong believer in patient choice 
And I, so I think, you know, we, each person needs to make their own decision on that. Topic. Well, thank you. Because that's why I ask because I've seen so much fear mongering on both sides to the point of irrationality. <laughs> so that's why yeah. I, I like to at least ask that difficult question sometimes to see the personal stance that each doctor that we can't get to come in contact with has, has had to make and take that stance because some people will, even as a publisher for us, you know, kind of dangle the bait out there. Like you said, right. getting outside of our scope. We're like, you know, chiropractors, we've got our own challenges. So, well, yeah. And freedom of choice, freedom of choice is a great part or point to start at. Of course, not everyone had freedom of choice, right? So when you get forced to do something immediately, it's, it's not comfortable. Yep. So. Yeah. And Very the other thing too, for anybody who wants to keep following, do you have any social media? How do people keep in touch with you in between? You know, obviously we've got the, the article in our magazine coming up here, but I wanted to check and see if there's any way we'll keep in touch with you or anybody else. Yeah, best way to to reach me is through my Logan email, which is my name, Elise, E-L-I-S-E dot Hewitt, H-E-W-I-T-T at Logan.edu. All right. So I try to stay away from social media as much as I can these so days. So what Dr. Hewitt means is to keep following you're, the American chiropractor. Yeah. We're going to have to follow all your excitement. So just keep us. Yeah. You're, you're, miss, <laughs> you're missing all those guys cracking babies and stuff, Elise. I mean, I don't know why. Yeah, you- that gives me nightmares. So. <laughs> I'm there with you. And I must Do you say, in to... our program, uh-huh. we have mm-hmm. um, spinal adjusting, cranial work, and extremity mm-hmm. adjusting all adapted for kids so that our graduates will be experts at the application of manual therapies to pediatric mm-hmm. patients. Fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. So well, keep doing what you're doing. We're so excited about it and glad to share it with our mm-hmm. readers and our listeners today. So. Thank you so much and keep us posted. We want to have some, now does, is there a time frame when the inscription and the classes begin? So if they missed getting in on this, like what's the frequency that the new class would start the next one? Yeah, good question. So we have two cohorts a year. So one starts in the fall and one starts in the spring. So our next cohort is going to start in spring of 2023. So we're accepting applications for that. We also have a few applicants already for fall of 2023 as well. So, okay. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. I just, I really enjoyed speaking with both of you and, um, and I just really appreciate what you're doing for our profession as well. Well, thank you. We look forward to seeing your program grow there with Logan and they're doing such great work over there too, as they brought on the sports science and now this. So it's very exciting. 